Good, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the final day of the conference. Before we get to our first session of the day, I've got several uh, announcements to make. First of all, the um, three speakers this morning all have books on sale with politics and prose in the room down the hall here. And that um, bookstore is going to be open this morning from 9 a.m. until noon, 9 until noon. Uh, next door, of course, is the Churchill Book Collector, who will also be open until noon. And to remind you, those um, press photographs that he has available for sale have never been uh, available for sale before. You are uh, getting the first opportunity to buy. After this morning, he will make those generally available online to his world of customers. Next, our silent auction is continuing, and that will also end at noon, and we will announce the winners of the bids uh, during lunch. But just to remind you what's available there, we have six items. The first, which is the largest that's on display there, is the signed lithograph of the painting by Edwina Sands, who is, of course, with us today and will be introducing our second speaker this morning. The second item is a copy of Churchill's 1941 speech to Congress, and this is also a unique item. This one has been donated um, by Mark Courage, the Churchill book collector. Um, it's unique in that it is an unbound copy, and so um, one of only about a half a dozen. So if you buy it, you would have the opportunity to then have it bound any way you like. The third item is the bespoke pen that's being offered, and you've seen the stand for the, the pen set up outside. The next three items are all um, guided tours in Britain. The first is of the Churchill War Rooms. Uh, each of these tours is for two to four people. The first is of the Churchill War Rooms in London. Uh, then there is the private tour of Chartwell, which everybody in this audience will be familiar with. And the last item is a tour of the Churchill Archives Center. Now, uh, that tour will be conducted by Alan Packwood, the director of the Churchill Archives Center, who is here with us this morning. And Alan has some um, um, right there. <laughs> but I want to let you know, Alan has um, enhanced this um, particular item. Not only will you get the personal guided tour from Alan, you will also get to have lunch in the fellows' room at Churchill College. So I think the value of that package just increased. So you're all encouraged to bid generously on that. All right, um, later this morning, of course, um, we'll be having lunch. And the directions about the buses to the cinema, which are printed in your program, are correct. The first bus will leave at 1215. And I'll give you more information about that before we break for lunch. But now let's get to the first panel of the morning. Uh, which is going to be a conversation style. And so to introduce our speaker will be the man who will be in conversation with him, and that's Professor Jim Muller. Oh, okay. Good morning and welcome to the second day of the conference. I'm Jim Muller. I chair the Board of Academic Advisors of the International Churchill Society. And uh, it's my honor to introduce our speaker, Mark von Hiking. John von Hiking. I'm sorry. It's OK. <laughs> John von Hiking. It's early in the morning. Um, what we're going to do this morning is have a conversation about friendship. And I think it's a, a very suitable conversation for our morning because coming to these meetings and being together for several days in an interesting city with uh, people who become friends over the years has enriched my life and that of several 
others in my family who have come almost as often. And for us to be together in Washington, D.C. with friends is a great pleasure, especially friends from uh, a number of different countries. And John has written a book about friendship, which comes out of his study of classical political philosophy, but has been enriched and sharpened by study of Winston Churchill. And so we want to talk about that, about what friendship is. Now, it might seem odd um, in Washington, D.C. to be talking about friendship <laughs> because often people think that most of those um, who are considered friends in Washington are uh, just fair weather friends or friends for the sake of uh, some useful purpose one hopes to get from being acquainted with them. And in fact, this is one of the points mm -hmm. that is made early in this book. Uh, so I want to ask you, mm -hmm. uh, just to start, yeah. what is it that you mean by a Washington friend yeah. when you put that in quotation marks? Yeah. And what's lacking about it? Yeah. It, it's a term that uh, a New York Times reporter uses in his book on the networking style of Washington insiders. The book is called This Town, and Washington Friends is exactly as he described it. People who kind of associate with one another for gaining some sort of personal or, or more likely political advantage so that they can climb up the greasy pole and of course everybody's trying to climb over everybody else. Um, what kind of comes through in that, that author's treatment is that these are actually very lonely people. These are people who kind of have something missing in their lives, something important. Um, and in, in a way, the politics kind of reflects that. So it's kind of a, a lack of character uh, to a certain degree that, that Washington friend, as a term of irony, I guess, um, conveys. What is it about Churchill yeah. that allowed him to have friends that were more serious than that? Yeah, well, Churchill was a great practitioner of the art of politics and the art of... Toward the end of um, a meal at Chartwell, um, his, his daughter, Mary Soames, told me, Churchill, um, when his wife was signaling him that it was time to, uh, to, to close the proceedings, to finish the meal, would often look around with some regret and say, let us command the moment to remain. Hmm. Can, can you surmise or imagine why that might have been? This is uh, the, the, the dinner time conversation, much as you, as you opened our session with uh, the development over the years of, of friendships in, in gatherings like this. For Churchill, that really, I think, in many ways is the good life for him. That's what human beings are, are kind of at their happiest and most fulfilled, and they, they are together enjoying warmth with one another, enjoying a kind of civilized conversation. And I mean, Churchill is, is very much part of that British tradition of clubbable, well, clubbable men. So in, in the sense that um, social clubs um, are, are a very important part of English history going back at least 150 years prior. I mean, he and Birkenhead founded the other club in 1911. Um, because they couldn't get into the club, which was what Samuel Johnson back in the day had founded. Edward Gibbon was a member, Edmund Burke was a member, I mean, all of these, these, these notables. So that was just part of what it meant to be a civilized human being and one who kind of could enjoy what life could, could offer and, and that, that kind of, of, of convivium and sociability. Churchill was obviously a friend to um, many animals in his own oh, yeah. um, uh, eye. Um, and I'm wondering what the range of friendship is yeah. that, um, that he explored and, and enjoyed. Yeah. I mean, to whom can one be a friend? 
Yeah, well, in some ways, my book uh, kind of treats that question in a narrow sense, kind of looking at the, the, the friends that he had who, with whom he, he, he worked with in politics, so kind of political friends. Um, in fact, I, I, I purposely, I, I don't even go into the, to the discussion of his friendship with his, his most important friendship with Clementine because that just adds for me, that just added a, a layer of complexity for me that I just didn't want to touch. <laughs> um, but at, at any rate, at least with his political friends, he was very interested in establishing friendships with people of stature, people who um, kind of enjoyed politics as a kind of um, serious game both a game but a serious game. So there's a kind of magnitude of, their, of, their, um, of, 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 of what they enjoyed. I wouldn't say that Churchill had a large range of friends. Um, in, in that way, he took himself too seriously to have too many friends. Yeah. But those he did make, that, you know, those are important. His family was obviously very important to him. Mm -hmm. um, but does he think it's possible to be a friend in some way uh, to one of his departed ancestors. Yeah, yeah. Well, he writes that biography of Marlborough in the 1930s, and I, I actually devote two chapters to that in the book, um, because I think in, in some ways that it's the consummate statement of his political wisdom. And uh, at one point, somebody, I think it was um, um, Mackenzie King, the, the, the Canadian Prime Minister at the time, asked, he asked Clementine, you know, how has Churchill changed? Did he learn anything by writing this book on Marlborough? And Clementine said, he learned to be patient. And now if you can imagine, uh, you know, <laughs> Churchill wasn't known for his patience, but he learned patience. And I think, I, I mean, in some ways, uh, Clementine's response, I, I think, sort of um, un both underscores, but in some ways doesn't quite grasp at what Churchill learned. He, he really learned the deepest meanings, moral meanings, of what friendship is, especially in the example of Marlborough and his very good friend, uh, Eugene of Savoy. And, uh, I mean, there you have two very good friends kind of running a pincer movement to try to defeat the, the central European despot, who at that time was Louis XIV. And, of course, it's very hard to, to not read Marlborough, the biography, as Churchill kind of taking notes of what needs to be done, you know, in a few years. Um, and in, in that sense, I mean, one of the reasons why Churchill wrote that biography of Marlborough um, not only for his own edification, but he wanted to save Marlborough's reputation from uh, people like Macaulay. I mean, Macaulay was a great inspiration for Churchill for learning English history, but he, 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 he dishonored Marlborough. And uh, Churchill kind of writes that biography as a way of saving Marlborough's uh, honor, kind of as an act of piety. Um, and so he's kind of in conversation across the centuries with Marlborough, right? I mean, I, I think we, we, everybody in this room can appreciate how living history or how Churchill regarded the, the, the deeds of the past as something to always be kind of in living communion with, and that always inspired him, and Marlborough is, is one, of, one of those examples. Marlborough had some very close friendships. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. not just with Eugene, yeah. but with others in mm -hmm. Britain and um, some foreigners as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, of the domestic friends, um, Churchill treats Marlborough's network of friends as kind of the nucleus of what would become the modern English nation. And so he kind of treats Marlborough's time as a kind of hinge of when, um, and of course, Marlborough, as, as, as John Churchill, um, he was instrumental in the Glorious Revolution, as many people know. So, he, I mean, England had its revolution, um, you know, kind of became a parliamentary democracy, but John Churchill, the Duke of Marlborough, was kind of the instigator of a lot of that, and in, in some ways the guardian of that revolution. So, Mar so Churchill treats uh, Marlborough as a kind of pivot point in English history, as somebody who turns England in many important respects into a modern nation. And in, in, in that sense, his Marlborough biography is also an English history. One of the arguments you make in your book is that 
Churchill seems to think or to understand that a political deed isn't actually done mm -hmm. uh, until it's shared with a friend. Yeah. And I wondered if you could exp uh, sure. explain that to yeah. us because that's a, a rather unusual argument yeah. and, and an interesting one. Yeah, well, it kind of gets to his dinner time conversation, right? People like to talk. Well, what do they talk about? Well, what, friends, you know, during the day they go off and do stuff. And in the evening, they, they enjoy their wine, they enjoy their convivium at the dinner table, and they talk. And so in, in human action, there, there, there's a sort of, we do stuff, and then we talk about it. And it, that, that talking about it takes on numerous forms. And um, in the case, sort of, I mean, that's kind of a, a, a micro example at the, at the political and a historical level where you see that, is that, I mean, Churchill, as everyone knows, won the Nobel Prize for Literature. And, and as a writer, that's, that's I mean, he, he, Churchill thought rhetoric was the soul of action. And so what that means is that it's not just the, the performance of deeds, but it's also the writing of the histories. It's the, the, the explaining of those deeds to put them into context. And in the Marbar biography, it's very interesting. It's a very praising biography, and, and there are many proclamations of Marlborough's military and political genius, but there is a devastating criticism that Chir Churchill makes of his ancestor, which is Marlborough just assumed that his deeds and his palace would speak for themselves. Churchill, it's a, it's a, it's a very important criticism. He says, Marlborough should have written a memoir. And Churchill says of his own act of writing this book, I'm kind of doing my ancestor a favor, kind of completing the thought, completing the action, by explaining it, finally. So in the sense that you know, friends do things together and then they talk about it, in that sense, what, what Churchill's doing by writing the biography is he's kind of completing the project that Marlborough started. In Churchill's essay, Painting as a Pastime, mm -hmm. He says that um, painting, uh, a, a, a painting, especially a large painting like one of the ones by Turner's, it is a tremendous intellectual effort and achievement, yeah. um, partly because of the importance of memory. And he compares it, though, to many other kinds of things uh, that one has to do that require many complicated steps and so on. And one of them is fighting a battle. Yeah. And he says um, fighting a battle is really um, less successful because the enemy keeps trying to interfere and mess <laughs> things up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> is, is Churchill making some kind of a statement there about the difference between thinking mm -hmm. or speaking and doing, which yeah. was, of course, a theme in his autobiography as yes, well. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, what's fascinating about that wonderful um, essay on, on painting is that it is kind of a metaphor for the, the art of a statesman and the art of a military leader. And, of course, in his histories, when he's describing um, you know, his own strategic oversight of the battle scene and, and, and the political situation, he frequently uses these artistic um, metaphors. So to have an oversight over the whole scene, right? that, that kind of notion. And of course, military strategists, not just Churchill, use that. I mean, he's actually, I think, drawing on a tradition of military strategists who'd speak that way. Uh, Clausewitz being, being one of them, kind of talks about the stroke of the eye and, and so forth. Um, and the other thing that I found quite interesting about that painting is, is that, you know, Churchill quite often was criticized for being a big picture sort of person, but having no eye for details. Um, and, you know, whether or not that's true, um, at least in the painting essay, he shows how you need to attend to both. And painting is, is, I think, for him, I mean, on the one hand, painting for him is a, a kind of mode of contemplation that he could do um, when he wasn't, 
you know, had the, the, the burdens of office. So in that sense, it was kind of restful, but at the same time, is also kind of using another part of his brain. But at the same time, it, it's also um, kind of reinforced, I think, some of the ways he thought about his art of, art as, of a statesman. Uh, in his autobiography, um, My Early Life, he, of course, um, limits uh, the, the span of his life he talks about to uh, the time between his earliest memories and uh, his marriage to his wife. Um, and so an awful lot of that book um, talks about his military adventures, his early military adventures. Um, and he also talks about some of his school friends and mm -hmm. so forth. But um, above all, especially right at the beginning, he talks about his, his relations with his parents. Yeah. And um, he, 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 uh, he makes two um, remarks, about uh, one about each of his parents. And I'd be curious what your reactions to those are. One is that... Um, he says his relations with his mother, um, as he grew up and became a man, became more like those of a brother and sister hmm. than those of a mother and son. And um, of his father, he says m many interesting things. Um, probably the most telling is that when he was a boy, his father seemed to ha him to have the key to everything worth having. But, of course, his father always seems to have had a, 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 um, a less than, than high impression of uh, what was going to happen to the son. Yeah. And, um, uh, and that leads, of course, much later to this essay he wrote after the Second World War, The Dream, in which he imagines a conversation he never was able to have with his father but ends up failing to tell him um, what he did during the Second World War. Yeah. Um, what do you think is the significance of that, yeah. of that essay, The Dream? Yeah, it, it's, it's a really fascinating essay. And um, you know, there, there's a whole sub-industry of Churchill uh, commentary that kind of psych tries to psychoanalyze him and you know, daddy issues and I suppose mummy issues uh, as well. But uh, what, what I read, in that essay is actually the opposite that 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 actually represents that he was standing on his own two feet and really didn't need the 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 validation of his father anymore he didn't need to tell his father what he had done because in some ways not only was he standing on his two feet but he surpassed lord randolph um in in, in some ways as he surpassed uh john churchill and um, that's a really interesting observation about um, his relationship with his mother, that now we were like brother and sister, too. And, and uh, I mean, that's always, in everybody's life, that there's always these moments of, of when a, a child can be grown up enough and, and earn the respect of their parent that they can kind of regard one another more as equals now. Yeah, yeah. Well... You are a college professor, as I am, and I'm curious what your experience has been teaching Churchill yeah. to university students. Yeah. And I'm wondering about that, especially at a time when all of us have noticed that students are different mm -hmm. and generations of students are different, and one of the things that has begun to happen is that when students walk out of the classroom after a class, often um, in our generation they were uh, talking to each other, uh, making new friends, uh, and, and having a conversation about what they had just been learning about in class. Yeah. And now what typically happens is they walk out the door um, turning on their <laughs> cell phone and um, staring at it and um, if they say anything it's excuse me as they bump into somebody who is <laughs> also coming into the classroom looking at a cell phone. <laughs> yeah, I'm just yeah, curious, yeah. Um, how do you teach yeah. them about 
conversation. Yeah. Well, in, in some ways, that, that's, the, that's the, the big challenge. Um, I mean, you read survey after survey that uh, today's college students say they're more lonely, they're more anxious than previous students. And one of my uh, motivations for, for studying friendship more broadly, not just Churchill, but kind of as a moral question, is that you know, people kind of need to learn or maybe relearn the arts of friendship. And the nice thing about being a college professor is that I can kind of shoehorn them. They're kind of a captive audience. <laughs> and they have to talk. They have to, you kind of have to initiate them into the arts of conversation um, over whatever's on the agenda for that day or what's on this, the course outline. Um, I've taught uh, Churchill to uh, kind of upper level uh, students. And one of the things that they really, you know, discover is not only the arts of friendship as practiced by a politician, but friendship as something that is central to the art of politics. I teach political science, so of course I'm teaching politics. And, and that is something that they rarely see. And so that's really neat. Then when they finally, you know, it's not everybody quite gets it, but when they do, it's sort of like, oh, aha. Uh -huh. And then what I find especially gratifying is that then they become friends with one another and then they gra graduate, but then they kind of have that, oh, you, know, you kind of hope, but lifelong friendships with each other afterwards. So it does happen, but you kind of have to nudge them. I have one last question for you, and then I wanted to save a bit of time for questions from the audience. Um, because I found this a very, very interesting book. And um, there have been more than a thousand biographies of Churchill, but there is no book like John's. So um, if you don't have it, um, there probably are still some in the bookshop. And uh, there's one up here. This is what it looks like. But my last question yeah. to you is um, your book has uh, what might appear to be a strange title. Yeah. Would you tell us the title and mm -hmm. explain it for us? Yes. So the, the, the title of the book it, 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 the, is called Comprehensive Judgment in Absolute Selflessness. And then it's got a subtitle, Winston Churchill on Politics and Friendship. The, t the, the main title um, is taken from a line from his biography of Marlborough, which kind of captures what he sees in Marlborough. And I'll just, I, I just, I'll just read the line for you, if I may. He's, he says... It is these qualities of perfect, comprehensive judgment, serene in disappointment or stress, unbiased by the local event in which he was himself involved, this fixing with untiring eye and absolute selflessness, the problem as a whole that deserve the study and respect of soldiers of every age. So that's kind of right at the core of how he's reading Marlborough and I think how he's reading himself. Well, you were a bold man to make that the title of your book. <laughs> and I wish you well. Thank you very um, much. What questions are there? Ah, one from a Canadian. <laughs> yeah. John, yes. I am curious. Oh, thank you. Uh, John, I, I'm curious as to your thought on Churchill's decision to not attend Roosevelt's funeral. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's always kind of a, of, of a sticking point. And I've been... Uh, Unfortunately, I didn't bring Andrew Roberts' biography with me here so I could look it up, but he actually says something new about it. So the, the general kind of way that, that people have commented on was, A, well, that's just proof that Churchill was not a genuine friend of, of Roosevelt. Um, John Meacham, in his very fine book, uh, argues that it was kind of a fit of, of, of kind of petulance or even self-pride um, that Churchill did not want to make that one more trip across the Atlantic. He didn't want to be the, the suitor to the, to the replacement, to, to Truman. Um, and if, if memory serves me correctly, and please correct me if I'm wrong, um, I think one of the things that Andrew Roberts says in his biography, and this is the, the, the archives that, that he was able to access, that I think the king actually didn't want him to go. And, and I may be incorrect on that, but there were some external ep impediments that prevented him from, from going. No, I think the king did want it. They didn't want it. Okay, then I'm misremembering. Um, 
Yeah, but there was something in that biography that, that, that kind of stuck out and said, well, that actually kind of works in favor of the argument that he was actually friends with Roosevelt, right? So if anybody has that biography in front of them, you know, if you can look it up. Um, yeah. Um, Eisenhower divided his friends into those he liked and those he didn't like. Uh, <laughs> and those he played golf with. <laughs> um, and I wonder, I don't think Churchill would have done that, but I'm yeah. curious to know what you think about his friendship with Stalin, because um, yeah. to some extent it replicated the romantic relationship between Marlborough and Eugene. And to some extent, yeah. Churchill knew exactly what Stalin was like and, yeah. and what, a, what a, a fiend he was. Yeah. Uh, and, and yet he seemed to say on occasions that you know, he could get on with this man, he could do business with this yeah. man. Yeah. And even um, sort of, uh, to some extent, romanticized him. So wh yeah. what do you think g g going on there? I, I think a lot of that uh, would have been rhetorical in, in the sense of trying. I mean. He, he, of necessity, he had to work with Stalin. So I, I would actually not say that he, he was friends or friendly with, with, with Stalin. Um, I think actually Harry Hopkins plays a very crucial role in being a mediator between uh, Stalin and Roosevelt and, and Churchill a, as well. Uh, I mean, when, when Roosevelt is making fun of Churchill in, in Tehran, uh, it, it's a, you know, the reason he's making fun of Churchill is because he's trying to impress Stalin. Stalin doesn't like him at all. And of course, Stalin distrusts Churchill because of his anti-communism, but yet they all have to kind of work, work, work with each other. Um, when, when Stalin is talking about how he's trying to make a connection with, with sorry, when Roosevelt speaks of when he's trying to make a connection with Stalin, that's fascinating because he's frustrated. And he says, you know, he's like a wall of ice, and I'm trying to kind of break through that, and I'm trying to make a personal connection. And, I mean, that, that sense of needing to make a personal connection at the highest levels of, of power, I think, says something about the arts of friendship as something that's necessary. But, you know, there are limits. <laughs> I mean, Churchill had this joke, and I think it was a joke, where he says, if I could only dine with Stalin once a week, then everything would be fine. <laughs> I think it was a joke. <laughs> we have another question here. John, um, do you address his relationship with his brother Jack? Um, and if, you, if so, would you elaborate? And how did their father feel about Jack? Did he yeah. have more aspirations for him than yeah. he did Churchill? I'm afraid I can't. I, I, I really didn't look into that, so I really don't have an answer. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 Well, it's hard not to be in the shadow. Yeah. Well, uh, I think we're just about out of time, but thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Let me recommend again the book, which is well worth reading. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Give us just one moment, and we're going to go directly into our next speaker, but we have to get set up here.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience. Again, as a reminder, the books for um, all three of our speakers this morning, as well as the books by Edwina Sands, who's about to introduce our next speaker, are available. And the authors are all here and so available to sign those books this morning. So to introduce our next speaker, I would like to uh, bring welcome to the stage Edwina Sands. Hello, everybody. Hello. Good morning. Uh, well, it's a great pleasure to see you again, me on the platform. <laughs> Prefer to sit down and listen, but anyway, here I am to introduce a great friend and a great friend of all our family, Aurelia Young, Oscar Naimon's daughter. Now, this book. I haven't read it yet, but I know I'm going to enjoy it. And I'm very pleased that she chose this photograph for the cover. It's, it absolutely uh, combines Oscar Naimon and Winston Churchill. And because um, Naimon sculpted my grandfather, I think he had a better relationship with Naimon than than um, he did with Graham Sutherland. <laughs> and I think he was also more pleased with the outcome. <laughs> now, this is absolutely a historic picture because Grandpapa, as we all know, was a, an avid painter. But um, I think that um, Naimon could see that Grandpapa was getting a bit restless while he was sitting for him. And so he gave him a lump of clay and said, well, why don't I'm doing you, why don't you do me? And so this is the thing. And you can see the profile of Oscar Naimon here, very sharp and deliberate and defined profile he had. And Grandpapa caught him perfectly. So I think in a way, more difficult to sculpt Grandpapa than to sculpt Naimon. But he did it very, very well. Now, we first got to know about uh, Naimon because I think that, uh, I might not get it quite right, but I believe he met uh, the Churchill family in Marrakesh, particularly my grandmother's cousin Sylvia. We called her cousin Sylvia. And we got to know, we children got to know Naimon because he became a very close friend of my mother, Diana Sands. And he came to our house at Chester Row many, many times and he and my mother would smoke cigarettes. They didn't give it up like other people did, but um, they smoked cigarettes and the room was full of smoke and they would talk and talk and you'd walk into the living room and there they'd be deep in conversation. It seemed that they had so much to talk about and they became very good friends. And that's how I got to know Naimon. And when I got married and then divorced and started becoming an artist myself, first of all, I was painting, but then I, I decided to do some sculpture. And Naimon came into my house one day and um, he said, well, you need an armature because you can't just expect to do a large piece, a tall piece, just putting more one lump of clay on top of the other. So he went back to his studio and he brought me an armature. So then I did a sort of sculpture that could have spaces in it because it was held up by the wires. So that was a big important thing uh, to have such a famous artist give me a bit of advice. Now we went, um, then I started um, living in America and I heard, I heard from Naimon that he was coming to Kansas City to um, the unveiling of a sculpture he made of my grandparents sitting together. I think you've probably all seen it, maybe at Chartwell, there's a similar one there. So we had the unveiling in Kansas City. I don't know exactly the date, but um, Pamela Harriman came, and that was a big excitement for everybody. 
And um, no, it really was, by the way. Now, um, I feel um, that Naimon loved to talk about things and a few things he would talk to me about and tell me. And I really am sorry, a little bit like Jill Rose's, I, Jill Rose's point about not asking for memories until it's too late, because I think Naimon had an awful lot of secrets and, and quite a lot of um, memories of conversations with my mother, and I didn't ask my mother much, and I wish I had. So now I think I should take that to heart and talk to my children and grandchildren so they don't wake up one day and say, I wish we'd asked Edwina more things. So anyway, where is Aurelia? Wonderful Aurelia in green, evergreen. Come up. Thank you, Edwina. Wonderful. I put that there. You can hold it up. Let me go down. I'll put this back. Well, thank you, Edwina, for that marvelous introduction. Uh, before we begin, can we turn the lights a bit lower? And can you all move, look at one of the screens? <coughs> because this talk, when I had some water, <coughs> is going to be visual. Oh, marvelous. Here we are. This statue of Winston Churchill, which stands in the members' lobby of the House of Commons, was unveiled by Lady Churchill in 1969. Pathé News <coughs> sorry, was there to record the ceremony. So, who was Oscar Naimon, who could be rightly proud of his work? As we've discovered, he was my father, and this is how he became, in the words of Sir Martin Gilbert, Churchill's favorite sculptor. Everyone called him Naimon, including Edwina Sands and my mother, so I will too. <laughs> Naimon was born in Osijek, in Croatia in 1906. He studied in Vienna and Brussels, moving to London before the Second World War to escape from the Nazi threat. When he was in Brussels, he made this medallion, this medallion of the famous American aviator, Charles Lindbergh, who just made the first solo flight across the Atlantic. His first royal commission was to sculpt King Albert I of Belgium. This work can be seen in the Royal Palace in Brussels. Nemon visited England in the 1930s, where he took over a studio from Winston Churchill's friend, the French painter Paul Mars, who wrote this letter to Nemon in 1940, in which he says, I'm somewhat worried about the meeting of Molotov and the gangsters. I wonder what that's about. Naman was taught English by the caricaturist and author Max Beerbohm, 
who made this sketch of Namon. Namon often had lunch in the, at the Allies Club in Park Lane. However, the other members of the club objected to the scruffy sculptor with clay under his fingernails and tried to get him barred. The club's president, Sylvia Henley, Clementine Churchill's cousin, overruled them, arguing that, as a refugee from the Nazis, he was exactly the sort of person the club should welcome. Nemon married Patricia Villa Stewart, and they made their home in Oxford. I was one of their three children. Falcon, Aurelia, and Electra. I was named not after Julius Caesar's mother, who was also Aurelia, but after a Pullman railway carriage. <laughs> <coughs> Namon held many exhibitions in the 1940s. Queen Marie of Yugoslavia is looking at the bust of the baby son of the Duke of Marlborough, Lord Charles Spencer Churchill. The Duchess wrote to Namon asking if he could bronze the bust and inquired about the health of Pauline, Paul Mars's daughter. Here is Queen Marie again looking at the impressive bust of her son, the young King Peter of Yugoslavia, then in his early 20s. This is the bust of the Belgian Prime Minister, Paul Henri Spark, who is in England during the war. This bust can be seen in the European Parliament in Brussels. Now we're getting to the bit where you, which you've come for. One winter in the early 1950s, Nemo was invited to stay in Marrakesh at La Mamounier, the same hotel as the then Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, and his family. This vibrant painting is by Winston Churchill. Namon made a sketch of Churchill by observing him in the dining room. Sylvia Henley, Clementine Churchill's cousin and Namon's savior at the Allies Club, joined the Churchill party after a week and asked Namon if he had made a bust of the Prime Minister. Namon told her that he had, in fact, made <coughs> a small bust of him. Sylvia Henley was so excited when she saw the head that she immediately took it to show her cousin. Nemon wrote, only a few hours later, I received a note from Lady Churchill herself. Dear Mr. Nemon, I should much like to possess the little bust you have made of my husband. Would you be kind and let me know your fee? Your bust represents to me my husband as I see him, and I would like to have it just as it is. It would be a great joy for me to possess it. Yours sincerely, Clementine Churchill. Her request must have been granted. My dear Monsieur Nemo, <coughs> I had <coughs> sorry, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> I had no time before leaving for Tansier to reply to your letter. It is indeed kind of you to wish to give me that beautiful little bust of my husband. I shall always treasure it. Thank you very much. Yours sincerely, Clementine Churchill. This meeting marked a turning point in Namon's life and a long friendship with the Churchill family began. The young queen commissioned Nemon to make a marble bust of Churchill for Windsor Castle. Churchill insisted on choosing Nemon as the artist. Nemon worked on three heads at the same time and dreaded the after-lunch sessions with Churchill because he could be, in Nemon's words, bellicose, challenging, and deliberately provocative. The time came to ask Churchill to choose which head should go to Windsor. He came into the room in number 10, where the three shrouded heads stood. Nemon unveiled the most dramatic one and watched the great man's anger rising. You think I look like a crafty, shifty warmonger, do you? 
<clears throat> he went on to say that in addition to his doubtless bellicose qualities, he had many others which the work did not recognize. The second head, head fared no better being described as too intimate. Fortunately, the third head was declared to be civilized and is now on display at Windsor Castle. In 1952, Sir Owen Moore's head, librarian at Windsor Castle, wrote to Namon. I was rung up yesterday evening by Colville, the PM secretary, who wanted to tell me what a work of genius he held your sketch of the Prime Minister to be. He knows Mr. Churchill well, having been one of his secretaries during the war, and this is what he said to me. He has depicted the PM with a slight smile round his mouth, and to such an extent is it like him that if I were to walk into the room 20 years hence and see it, it would give me a lump in the throat. In 1955, the City of London commissioned Namon to make a statue of Churchill for the Guildhall. In a film you're about to see, Churchill is making his way to the Guildhall for the unveiling ceremony a month after he'd stepped down as Prime Minister. <coughs> Here, you see Sarah Churchill holding her father's hand. During his speech, Churchill praised the talents of the sculptor. Here I am, aged 10, with my mother and brother, my brother Falcon, in Nemon's studio. On the right, you can see the head of Churchill's baby granddaughter, Emma Soames, who used to run about during the sittings at number 10 Downing Street. Nemon loved portraying children and couldn't resist sculpting this little cherub. In the background, you see the head of, Cher of Churchill's son-in-law, the member of parliament, Duncan Sands, the husband of Churchill's eldest daughter, Diana, and father of Edwina and Celia. Namon was very fond of Diana, and whilst he was sculpting her, he would sometimes take me to play with Celia. 
here we are on the wall of their London home in London. Oh, their London home in the wall, wall, the wall of their home in London. The 1950s and 60s were Nemon's golden period. He sculpted the Queen for Christchurch College, Oxford. When Nemon forgot to turn up for his sitting with the Queen in Buckingham Palace, the Queen laughed and nicknamed him the missing Oscar. She said it had never happened before, <laughs> understandably. <laughs> when Churchill was over 80, he decided to try his own hand at sculpture and did this preliminary sketch of Nemon before he went on to make a bust, which is on display in Churchill's studio at Chartwell. In a moment, you'll hear Nemon's soft voice telling an interviewer how Churchill came to do the sculpture. Nemon sculpted Randolph Churchill at his home in Essex. And this is a closer look at the bust, which seems to have disappeared. Here is Mary Soames with a bust Nemon made of her at her home in London. In her book, Speaking for Themselves, Mary Soames wrote a footnote. Oscar Nemon, brilliant sculptor, commissioned by the Queen to create a bust of WSC for Windsor Castle. Nemon became a friend of the family. After Churchill's death in 1965, a committee was set up to find a suitable way to re erect a memorial to Sir Winston Churchill in the House of Commons. The Labour Member of Parliament, Emmanuel Chinwell, was the chairman of the committee which decided to commission Nemon to make a bronze statue of Churchill which would be placed on the vacant plinth by the Churchill Arch at the entrance to the, house, uh, the, to the chamber of the House of Commons. The Churchill Arch is so named because Churchill stood there in May 1941 and saw the chamber in ruins after it had been bombed in the war. The then Minister of Information advised that no publicity should be given to the disaster. Churchill replied, publish it to the world and leave that arch to remind those who come after how they kept the bridge in the brave days of old. Nemon depicted Churchill striding through the rubble of war-torn London. At the ceremony, Nemon said, I was trying to express an idea of impatience and hurry of a man wanting to see something done. After the unveiling, an art critic wrote that the statue combines truculence, pugnacity, with a hint of humour. You can see the chamber of the House of Commons through the arch with a speaker's chair at the far end. MPs touch Churchill's toe for luck before making important speeches, and the public has joined in this habit. The bronze wore so thin that a sign was put up asking people not to touch the foot. <laughs> Field Marshal Montgomery was one of Churchill's many war leaders sculpted by Nemon. He w initially it was rather brusque. How long will it take you to finish this sculpture? He m demanded 
Nemon was unable to answer, saying it depended how difficult it was going to be. How many sittings did the Queen give you? Ten, he answered, although in fact she'd given him seven. What a waste of time, replied the Peel Marshal, but I'll give you ten sittings too. <laughs> this statue stands in Whitehall near the Cenotaph. The statue of Air Marshal Lord Portal stands on the Victoria Embankment. Nemon portrayed him looking up at the sky, anxiously waiting the safe return of the air crews serving under his command during the Second World War. Another of Churchill's war leaders immortalized by Nemon was Field Marshal Admiral uh, Viscount Alexander of Tunis. Jock Colville said of him, he was Churchill's beau ideal of a soldier and the admiration was mutual. Here you see Nemon with his two busts of Lord Breverbrook. Sir John Rothenstein wrote about one of these works. It is among the most searching of his portraits, Breverbrook's energy, independence, pugnacity, initiative, cynicism and humor are all subtly yet lucidly revealed. The New Zealander, General Freiburg, was a brave and much decorated soldier who commanded the Allied forces in Crete during the war. This bus stands proudly in New Zealand House in London. Lady Violet Bonham Carter, one of Churchill's oldest friends, became a close friend um, to, of Nemon. From all of Nemon's different busts to Churchill, she chose to keep this one, which she said was the most magnificent of all. I think this may be the bust that Churchill dismissed as being too bellicose. In her letter to Nemon, Lady Violet said, being given Nemon's head of her beloved Winston was like being given the moon. Before Nemon started his bust, he always sketched his sitters. Here he is, sketching Lady Churchill, preparing to make this statue of Sir Winston and Lady Churchill, which stands in the garden at Chartwell and also in Kansas City. Nemon is working on his clay head of Prime Minister Harold Macmillan. The clay bust was then cast in bronze and now stands in the members' lobby of the House of Commons, not far from the statue of his mentor, Sir Winston Churchill. The Queen granted Nemon a studio to work in, in some old storage place at S in St. James's Palace. This studio opened onto the Queen Mother's garden. She would often visit the studio to see how work was progressing and would share horse racing tips over a glass of gin. <laughs> Nemon was a, a very protective father, but luckily for me, he gave his blessing to my marriage to the politician George Young in Christchurch Cathedral, Oxford. Here are the young couple cutting the cake in front of Nemon's bust of the Queen at the re wedding reception in Christchurch Hall. <laughs> Nemon crossed the Atlantic to sculpt President Eisenhower. In January 1969, the president wrote to Nemon, you were most patient with me during the weeks you were in Gettysburg, and I'm grateful for this and the fine work you completed. The town of Westrum decided to honor its fam famous neighbor, and a statue of Churchill was placed on the green. Here is Namon with a committee who had raised the money for the statue. Pathé News was there to record the ceremony.
think that's Randall. Nineteen seventy nine saw the ushering in of a new Conservative government, and Nemon was commissioned to scout the Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. Mar uh, the sittings took place in Nemon's studio at St. James's Palace, amongst Nemon's many busts of Churchill. When Margaret Thatcher came to America, she gave this small version of Nemon's statue of Churchill to Congress. Here she is with Congressmen Bob Dole and Tip O'Neill. The Queen invited Nemon and Patricia to a party at Buckingham Palace. Patricia is wearing her tiara last war, law worn when she went to Buckingham Palace as a debutante. Queen must have forgiven Nemon by then. And here I am with my husband George wearing the same tiara after the opening of Parliament in the House of Lords. In 1984, Nemon was commissioned to make a relief of Diana, Princess of Wales. This is a photograph my brother Falcon took of the Princess at Kensington Palace. This is a sketch Nemon was preparing for the relief. He had one very enjoyable sitting with the Princess but died of a heart attack in hospital just before his second sitting. Diana wrote me a generous letter of condolence. Dear Lady Young, I just wanted to say how terribly sad I was to hear about your father. The very least I can do is send you my deepest sympathy and to say I'm thinking of your family a great deal. I was greatly looking forward to my next sitting with your father and now I will remember that happy hour I was fortunate enough to spend with him. Yours sincerely, Diana. This is the obituary that appeared in the Times newspaper, sculptor of the nation's leaders. The Queen said on one occasion that Nemon was the only person who could get Winston Churchill to do what he was told. <laughs> Jane Portal, now Lady Williams, was one of Churchill's secretaries in the 1950s. Jane Williams told me how she used to sit holding her pad for dictation whilst Churchill and Nemon talked to each other. She said that Churchill really liked Nemon and he didn't like everybody. <laughs> in the background of the photograph is Nemon's bust of Professor Ernst Chain, who Jane then well be worked for in the 1960s. In 2007, Edwina Sands and I were invited to unveil the bust of Churchill at the Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt Institute at Hyde Park, New York. Churchill's bust has been placed opposite the bust of his friend, <laughs> President Franklin Roosevelt, in the Institute's Freedom Court. As we know, Edwina is a renowned sculptor. And in the background, you see her two figures cut from a piece of the Berlin Wall. In 2009, one of Nemon's busts of the Queen was installed in the House of Lords. The bust is waiting to be unveiled by the Queen in the Royal Gallery. Here is the Queen unveiling the bust accompanied by Prince Philip. In 2011, President Obama was taken on a tour of the House of Commons before he addressed both Houses of Parliament. The President paused by the statue of Churchill and was allowed to touch the toe. <laughs> Maybe the President made a wish. <laughs> Thanks to the generosity of the International Churchill Society, Nemon's bust of, Ch of Churchill was installed in the Capitol in, in, in 2013. Many eminent senators were at the impressive ceremony. All the senators made speeches, telling the audience how much Churchill had inspired them. Churchill's grandson, Sir Nicholas Soames, 
made a speech about how much America had meant to his grandfather. This bust can be seen and maybe has been seen um, in the Freedom Foyer in the Capitol. One of Nemo's busts of Churchill has been placed in the new Winston Churchill Memorial Garden at Blenheim Palace. The Duchess of Cornwall and the present Duke of Marlborough unveiled the bust. One of my mother's friends wrote to me recently, I hope when you write a book about Nemon, you will not forget the magical, hypnotic, exotic quality your father had, a powerful passion not obvious under normal acquaintance, but perhaps the secret of his exceptional talent. I hope I've done my father justice by writing my book, Finding Nemon. For Nemon, Winston Churchill symbolized, in the words of Albie Rosenthal, his friend, greatness of character as a bulwark against inhumanity. This was the mainspring of Nemon's message as expressed in the numerous busts and statues of Churchill now in many lands. In his sphere, he was supreme, and his work has a secure place for all time. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. <clears throat> Nermon, that's very kind, thank you. Nermon often took casts of people's hands, and this is a cast of Churchill's hand, um, which now is owned by... Well, here it is. So, the it's in the Fort Church Joint. Yeah. Kind Tim has. So, if anybody would like to come and see, if anyone would like to come up and see the hand, it'll be here for a little bit. So, this is Churchill's hand. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Oh, if you want questions, yes. Well, perhaps they would like to have coffee instead. <laughs> right, yes, don't worry. Stunned. Somebody could think of something. Yeah, Edwina's going to say. Praise for Aurelia. You have really brought Naaman back to life for me and maybe many others. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Edwina. Oh. Right. I took figure sculpture and head sculpture in college, and I wonder first how long the sitting sessions were, and did you ever see your father take the big calipers to check yes. measurements? Yes, uh, yes. Well, I don't know how long the sittings took. He was very charismatic. People loved sitting for him, apart from probably Churchill, who didn't have time, and Sigmund Freud, who was also busy, um, and Montgomery. So I don't know really how long the sittings were, but sort of official sittings were about an hour, I think, probably with the Queen, like that. Um, yes, those wonderful calipers that have a big end one end and a little end the other. I definitely remember the seeing the calipers. And I really wanted to keep them, but last time I looked in his studio, I couldn't find them. Yes, the calipers have a great meaning. Oh, well, congratulations on being a sculptor. Wonderful presentation. How did your father get to know his subjects so that he could portray something essential about them? Well, he, I, he had, in the 1930s, when he was a very young man, he sculpted Sigmund Freud in Vienna and got really to know Freud quite well, as well as he... Anybody who buys the book, much should be recommended, um, uh, um, will discover he not only sculpted Freud, but nearly all of Freud's disciples. So he had a, quite a knowledge of psychoanalysis. Um, well, I don't know. He was just very talented. I mean, somehow he managed to get the personality into the work. Um, how? I don't know. You know? Uh, how do clever people do clever things? Sometimes we don't know. 
Tuesday at lunch at Hillwood, you told a wonderful story, a little story about uh, your father and Winston Churchill when uh, Churchill was sculpting him to keep him, your father wanted to keep him busy. Could you repeat that story? It was so uh, nice about um, how uh, Churchill uh, was interrupted. Your father wanted him to... Oh, I see. Yes, yes. <laughs> right, yes, right, yes. Um, because Churchill was a rather restless sitter, and it was thought that he, it would be a really good idea, as you see, to give him some clay so he could work, do some work on a bust, or perhaps Churchill decided, I don't know. Um, but anyhow, Churchill had his bit of clay sculpting Nemon as Nemon was sculpting him. But for Nemon, this was a complete disaster because Churchill would say, keep still, keep still. <laughs> <coughs> when Nemon wanted to you know, look around at him, from, so, so that wasn't actually such a, a, a wonderful idea for, for Nemon. Yes. <coughs> we were fortunate enough to see the bust at the, on the Capitol tour. Right. And as you know, I made a huge sink about the fact that there was no name of the sculptor. You explained to me, you found out from Lee Pollock why that was. Yes, sadly, <coughs> sadly, people don't very often don't put who the sculptor was on the works. In fact, in the big statue of Churchill in the House of Commons, there's no indication who did the sculpture. It's difficult. On, on the Montgomery statue, there's no indication who did the statue. It's rather bad luck because on the whole, paintings sometimes you know, say who it's by. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't think I can fight that battle if the capital says no, I don't think it's for me. It's, uh, it's sad, especially for posterity. Th thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thank uh, you. Given that your father was a refugee from Europe, do you know anything of the substance of the conversations between him and Churchill? Well, in he, yes, he wrote a, a quite a lot in his memoirs. He wrote a lot about Churchill. Um, some is in my book, but the one that I remember um, when he was having lunch with Churchill and Churchill said, I may have got it wrong, Tim, I have to look at the quote, um, Churchill said, when he gets to heaven and Sir St. Peter says, you can't come in, you're barred because you bombed Dresden and killed all those people, um, Churchill said, he will say, um, I would do it again, I would, I'm sorry that I can't quote exactly, to stop that terrible tyrant from you know, killing all our people. I can't remember it, the exact, but he was defending Dresden, basically. So, so they did talk a lot, and in my father's memoirs, he actually had a lot about what he talked to Churchill about. And in fact, there's a bit about, I don't know, um, Edwina's brother, um, but I, no, Julian, yes, about he asked a question, but now I can't remember, so that's all more reason to uh, buy a copy of the book. <laughs> <laughs> so. Thank you. Right. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to take our morning break, and we will reconvene in 15 minutes at 10.45.
is it director? The director of the Churchill Archives Center, and let me just remind you that you can get a personal tour of the Churchill Archives Center and lunch with him in the fellows room at the Churchill Archives Center if you bid on that. And the uh, auction sheet uh, will close precisely at noon. Um, but here is Alan Packwood. Right, good morning everybody. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for letting me make this introduction. Um, as many of you know, I only arrived here yesterday, um, but it sounds as though you've had an absolutely fantastic conference, setting the bar extremely high for those of us who are involved in organizing London 2020 next year. And you'll be hearing a little bit more about that very soon. I certainly would not have wanted to miss this opportunity, as it's a chance to really speak from the heart and to repay a very personal debt, because actually I owe peers everything. Without him, I certainly would not be standing here on this Churchill stage today, and I don't know where my career path might have taken me, but I'm sure it would not have been anywhere near as fun or as fulfilling. Peer was Piers was educated at Magdalen College, Cambridge, but in 1995, he became a fellow of Churchill College. And I know this because he was my predecessor as keeper, not director of the archives, as it was then styled. And it was Piers who was the man foolish enough to employ me as a young, naive, green archivist and to actually set me off working on the Churchill Papers collection. Little could either of us have then suspected that I would go on to be his, his successor. And his were certainly hard suede shoes to fill because he presided over a, a five-year program to catalog, exhibit, and microfilm Sir Winston's personal papers. Some two and a half thousand boxes an estimated one million items. And everything that we've done since in the Churchill Archive Center derives from his leadership during that key period. And more importantly, he was an extremely kind and generous boss, uh, at least as long as my captions were grammatically correct. <laughs> and he has remained a supporter, a mentor, and in keeping with today's theme, a friend to all in the Archive Center team, as has his wife, Vivian, who is here with him today. Piers has always been a great writer, a craft perfected for a lifetime of working with words in newspaper articles, reviews, television scripts, and many major publications. You will have seen him as a talking head on your TV screens. You will have heard him on radio. He's an expert on everything from Cornish poets to Thomas Cook, the travel agent, to the royal family. His works are erudite, but also exciting. They have humor and pace alongside great history. He's written biographies of Churchill and Eisenhower, and he's not shied away from huge topics. His book, The Dark Valley, is a definitive transnational guide to what went wrong in the 1930s. His decline and fall of the British Empire provides a masterfully comprehensive overview of the events that leave Britain perhaps struggling to find its international role today. I only wish that more contemporary politicians had been obliged to read them both. His latest book, Churchill's Menagerie, as it is titled here in the US, may seem more lighthearted, and perhaps we need that today, but it is still based on serious scholarship grounded in the archives and is packed full of revealing insights on how Churchill's love of animals shaped his character and permeated his writing and his language. I cannot recommend it highly enough. Buy it today. It's the perfect Christmas present. Okay, enough of the sales pitch. Now to the main event. Piers. Well, whatever I say after that's going to come as a dismal anticlimax. I, I really can't say. But I, I will say this, uh, the, that um, the one thing 
the one good deed, I think, uh, that I shall be able to uh, claim when I get to heaven is to have appointed uh, Alan as my successor. Not that I appointed him actually directly, but I think my influence counted uh, sufficiently um, with a lot of other people's influence because he has made the Churchill Archive Center into what you would call four presidential libraries rolled into one. So he is a major, major figure, and he's... Um, <laughs> And his energy and skill and diplomacy uh, is absolutely extraordinary. He doesn't even tell me what's going on. <laughs> he, he keeps it all very close to his chest, but he's, he's brilliant. Well, now, uh, on, to, uh, on to Churchill's bestiary, uh, as I originally called it. Uh, and you can see this wonderful image of Helen Oxenbury. She, those of you who have grandchildren will know, she is responsible for we're going on a bear hunt and she's the best drawer of bears in the world. And I got, she's a friend of mine, and I got her to... Uh, uh, <laughs> and actually, I mean, uh, th this, th this may sound like a joke, but it wasn't a joke, because H Hatchards, the big bookseller in, in Piccadilly, told me that their first somewhat excited inquiry about the book came from a customer who really did think that ch it related to Churchill and bestiality. Um, <laughs> a unique selling point, perhaps. <laughs> But um, understandably, my American publishers, Pegasus, have changed the title to Churchill's Menagerie. However, to be clear, I aim to show, uh, via the many animals marching through my pages, that Churchill was innocently, but in a quite extraordinary fashion, uh, preoccupied, amused, intrigued, enchanted, and besotted by creatures great and small. They included lions, leopards, kangaroos, horses, goats, dogs, swans, budgerigars, butterflies, and fish, right down to ants, bugs, locusts, flies, and tins of exceptionally well-bred maggots that he made a point of purchasing from Yorkshire at a cost of 22 shillings and sixpence a week to feed his cherished goldfish and golden orf at Chartwell. Aristocratic ma maggots these are, he sometimes said. Look how... <laughs> Look how well the fish are doing on them. <laughs> As this remark indicates, the book is lit up by Churchill's incomparable wit, his ebullient personality, and his patrician eccentricity. But although it's a jeu d'esprit, um, it's no mere entertainment, as Alan suggested, uh, and, and nor was Churchill's preoccupation with animals just a jokey, trivial, or incidental aspect of his life. Rather, as will appear, it was important for a whole host of reasons. For example, Church Churchill's love of horses, um, creatures which embodied romance wholly absent uh, from machines, illustrates a crucial dichotomy, a crucial division in, in his worldview. Um, on the one hand, he appreciated the revolutionary potential of science and technology, of cars and tanks and airplanes, um, and on the other, he deplored the replacement of the noble quadruped uh, by what he called the infernal combustion engine. Um, and here is a key paradox, I think, about Churchill, that his faith in a technological future was always tempered by his nostalgia for a chivalric past. Given his illustrious ancestry, of course, such nostalgia was understandable. Churchill was born at Blenheim Palace in 1874, as you all know, the grandson of the seventh Duke of Marlborough, and he was impeccably blue-blooded. Um, and he set much store by pedigree, uh, not just in humans, but in horses and dogs and much humbler creatures. For example, he maintained that his goldfish and golden orf uh, were a cut above finny plebeians such as vulgar tench and horribly common pike. Coarse fish in every sense of the word, very coarse. Furthermore, to explore, uh, explore another key paradox, Churchill conformed to the upper class convention that a gentleman spent much of his time hunting, shooting, and fishing, um, while at the same time doting on the horses hounds, and other furred and feathered friends with which he surrounded himself at home. As a small boy, he was a keen bug hunter. 
adept at netting butterflies, dragonflies, and moths. As a youth, encouraged by his father, Lord Randolph Churchill, he pursued game with a hound, gun, and rod. All his life, he reveled in the excitement of the chase. And he told his mother, Jenny, nay Jerome, that fox hunting was the greatest pleasure in the world. In India, thing, although Teddy killed huge amounts of game, uh, Churchill was relatively modest. Um, in France, Churchill hunted wild boar with furious energy. And I love this picture because it shows the sort of glint of, of excitement and, and satisfaction that he got um, from, from the chase. And he would certainly, I think, have agreed with Montaigne um, that um, he, he was always determined to be in, in, in at the kill, and he would have agreed with Montaigne that um, hunting without killing is like having sexual intercourse without an orgasm. <laughs> at Balmoral, he once dispatched three stags in a single day, and throughout his career, he enjoyed shooting grouse, pheasants, snipe, and partridge, and catching trout and salmon. And yet, here's the other side of the story. From infancy upwards, he was devoted to animals. He kept guinea pigs and tame bunnies while going out and shooting wild rabbits. He had an affinity with felines and signed himself in his letters home, the pussycat. At prep school, he was smitten by a dear little fox terrier puppy, and at Harrow, he, built, he bred silkworms and sold his bicycle to buy a bulldog, the purpose of which escaped his fond nanny, Mrs. Everest. I don't know if you can read that, unless, she says in that letter to him, unless it is to keep us all in the terror of our lives. Subsequently, at Chartwell, his pocket Blenheim in Kent, Churchill accumulated an extensive menagerie. He lavished care, cash, and emotion on the well-being of its inmates, who became part of his extended family. And he always referred to them in comically refined terms. Dogs did not make messes on the carpet. They committed indiscretions. <laughs> Cows did not breed. They attended to their family affairs. Fish were not pregnant, but in an interesting condition. Dwelling amid fauna and flora, he said, was the ideal form of existence. He went further once remarking that the world would be better off if it were inhabited only by animals. And Robert Boothby, his sometime parliamentary private secretary, uh, he, he exaggerated when he said Churchill had little regard for human life, least of all his own, but that he would cry over the death of a swan or a cat. But it is absolutely true that Churchill was moved to tears while uh, contemplating the area bombing of Germany during the Second World War. And this is what he said. 10,000 lives were extinguished in one night. Old men, old women, little children, yes, yes, children about to be born, and, and bushy cats. The lisping delivery, combined with the pathetic conclusion, provoked nervous laughter among those at the dinner table. And when Churchill detected it, he turned in a flash and said, in deadly earnest, when I mention pushycats, I would not have you think I take them lightly. However, Churchill expected his own felines to face the Blitz bravely, and he was mortified during uh, an air raid um, in, uh, in 1940, I think, uh, when his black cat, Nelson, hid under a chest of drawers at number 10 Downing Street during an air raid. Come out, Nelson he commanded, shame on you, bearing a name such as yours to skulk there when the enemy is overhead. <laughs> Blackie was evidently a truer embodiment of the traditions of the senior service. As I've suggested, Churchill's ambivalence towards the brute creation was not unique. English aristocrats and others um, had no difficulty in recognizing had no difficulty in recognizing their traditional addiction to blood sports with a fondness for animals. And, and there you see a Cornish uh, master of foxhounds who actually was quite a, uh, a, a relatively humble man. Um, but he was, in fact, uh, my, my great-grandfather. Um, 
But he, was, he, he wasn't grand. He, he um, accepted being a grandfather. He was, uh, he, he was actually only a rich farmer. But you can see the, the, f the, 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 the attraction that uh, those sort of blood sports uh, had for people at the time. But Churchill related to animals in a highly idiosyncratic fashion. Such was his empathy for the livestock farmed at Chartwell, for example, that he opposed slaying any creature to whom he had said good morning. <laughs> On one memorable occasion, he asked his wife Clementine to carve the goose because it was a friend of mine. <laughs> and on another, he was also hesitated uh, at the table um, to carve a large roast chicken. And when Clemmy uh, told him to hurry up and get on with it, uh, he, he s replied in a voice fraught with emotion, I'm just wondering if this is Ethel. <laughs> Ch Churchill engaged with animals on a personal level. Of course, many people talk to their pets and to other creatures, endowing them with the language in a vain endeavor to bridge the gulf that, between, that lies between the species. But Churchill was the complete anthropomorphist. More than most, he invested animals with human characteristics and communicated with them as individuals. And thus, he offered his thoroughbred coat, colt, col uh, uh, colonist, the, the second, an enticing reward for victory, which apparently expla explained why he came forth in a particular race. I told him, this is a very big race, and if he won, he would never have to run again, but spend the rest of his life in agreeable female company. <laughs> Colonist II did not keep his mind on the race. <laughs> Churchill wrote letters to and from his poodle, Rufus, an animal it was hard for others to like because of his appalling halitosis. One private secretary said that Rufus had breath like a flamethrower but Churchill doted on him and made elaborate endeavors to arrange his marital affairs. Um, he sat Rufus on his, uh, 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 he, this is a, a, a proposal. You can see that it's marked very private. and You can understand why if you can manage to read it. Um, Churchill didn't want, uh, he didn't want this uh, generally known. Um, Ch Churchill sat Rufus on his lap during films and once when they were watching the scene in Oliver Twist, uh, in which Bill Sykes prepares to drown his dog, uh, Bullseye, to put the police off the, off the scent, uh, Rufus cover, uh, Churchill covered Rufus's eyes with his hand, saying, don't look now, dear. I'll tell you about it afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Churchill held telepathic converse with his sheep friendly, uh, thinking of giving him bread, only to be amazed when Friendly came over the hill, ran down, started to gallop, and came down, and he said that this uh, sheep was invested with an astonishing occult intelligence. Churchill communed most often with his cats. On the 3rd of June, 1941, for example, when he was very worried about military set setbacks in, in North Africa, he had lunch at Chartwell with his private secretary, Jock Colville. Chartwell's almost closed up to whom he said almost nothing. And um, he, he talked uh, only to his marmalade cat, Tango. Uh, Churchill recorded, uh, Colville recorded, he kept up a running conversation with the cat, cleaning its eyes with a napkin, offering it mutton, and expressing regret that it could not have cream in wartime. And Churchill also corresponded with his animals, not just uh, arranging their marital affairs, but he, he wrote to them, um, uh, uh, he, he, uh, I don't know how this was actually arranged, but I think the secretaries must have done it. But they wrote letters from Nelson to him, and he wrote back to them via the secretaries to Nelson, saying, well, thank you very much, Nelson, for your congratulations on my birthday. That, 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 was, that was the kind of thing that went on. Churchill also had an adoring relationship with his azure blue and emerald green budgerigar, Toby, I'm afraid I haven't got a good picture of this, but uh, that's the only one that was available. Toby pecked at Churchill's cigars. He strutted across the dining room table. He fought with his reflection in the silver pepper pot, and he chattered like a schoolgirl at a picnic. Moreover, to Toby literally made his mark on visitors. In the course of one call, making no fewer than 14 messes on the bald head of the Chancellor of the Exchequer, R.A. Butler, 
The Chancellor was amused by, uh, by this, uh, uh, though Churchill, Churchill addressed the Chancellor as old cock, whereas he called Toby darling. Um, and wiping his, his, his bald pate with a white silk handkerchief, Butler sighed, the things I do for England. <laughs> Toby acquired such a taste for alcohol that he once fell into his master's brandy glass. But this did nothing to diminish Churchill's affection for him, and he determined to purchase a similar bird for Field Marshal Montgomery. Um, but in deference to Monty's strict standards of temperance, he stipulated that his budgie should be a teetotaler. In August 1942, when Churchill first visited the Kremlin, he attempted to convey his enthusiasm for goldfish uh, to Stalin, and it was a piquant episode which perfectly illustrates, I think, the gulf between the soft-hearted Western Democrat and the blood-stained Oriental despot. <laughs> Churchill told Stalin that he was very f fond of goldfish, and the Soviet leader hospitably invited him to have some for breakfast. <laughs> it, in the 1950s, Churchill became even more infatuated, if possible, with tropical fish filling chart wool and checkers with large tanks full of slivers of quicksilver, a living kaleidoscope, a glittering piece of kinetic art. And as if mesmerized, Churchill would gaze at them for 20 minutes at a time, extolling their beauty, admiring their colors, exclaiming on their antics. He also endowed them with human personalities, and he dilated on their love life, all the while puffing away at a cigar, and that was a cartoon uh, reflecting on that. Um, once he was overheard addressing one of his guppies, their trop tropical minnows, in these terms. Darling, I do love you. I would make love to you if only I knew how. <laughs> <coughs> Churchill doted almost as much on goats. We've had a little bit of goat, and um, this fills out, I think, what... Klaus was telling us uh, about the Bermuda Conference. Um, Churchill went to considerable trouble to ensure that the Welsh Fusiliers formed a guard of honor at his summit meeting with President Eisenhower and the French Premier Joseph Laniel in Bermuda in 1953 because their regimental mascot was a beautiful white goat uh, called Billy, inevitably, with whom I made friends in Jamaica. And there's a very funny transcript of a conversation where he gets the Minister of War to send this goat across uh, to, to Bermuda. He, he sends him, in the end, his final adjunct uh, 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 admonition is, fumigate the, the goat and fly it. <laughs> so, so the goat came, and... Um, it, the, the goat actually was responsible for a, a, a bit, bit of a sort of diplomatic crisis in, in uh, Bermuda because um, it caused much indignation in the French press when Churchill lavished far more attention on the goat than he did on Laniel. In fact, he didn't like Laniel, as we've heard, debt to the French. Um, and at, a, at the concluding banquet um, in Government House, um, where the Prime Minister rewarded the goat with a glass of champagne and the President gave it a cigarette. Um, it was a, another little frisson of excitement because the, the goat accepted the champagne but rejected the cigarette. And um, Churchill had to write to Ike afterwards explaining that, um, that he shouldn't take this rejection personally as Billy had informed him that he understood that there was no smoking on parade. Um, and Ike replied in a funny letter in which he said uh, that he was most impressed by the goat's soldierly deportment. Um, but actually, uh, the goat did play a, a bit of a, 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 an important part in this because, as, as we've already heard, the, the two leaders were at, at odds over the, the summit. And um, Church, uh, Ike was so amused by Churchill's devotion to the goat um, that it actually helped to ease Anglo-American relations. So the goat actually did play, play a part, um, which was strained, as, as we've heard at, at the time. Um, in fact... Churchill had Catholic tastes in animals. He was keen on parrots, despite the fact that his own sometimes bit him on the thumb, provoking bellows of unparliamentary language. Along with other wildfowl, ducks were honored guests at Chartwell. Uh, when he received some coom duck from India in 1934, uh, Churchill wrote, and this was at the time when he was 
busy um, opposing Indian independence. He hoped, he said, uh, he, he wrote to the, 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 the donor of the goats, he's, the, of the, uh, the Coombe Duck, he said that he hoped by firm government to make them loyal subjects. <laughs> Churchill treasured his cows, and on arriving in Normandy after the successful D-Day landings, landings, he coined a richly bucolic image to express his joy. We are surrounded by fat cattle lying in luscious pastures with their paws crossed, he said. And when playing golf, he once removed a worm from the fairway, saying, poor fellow, if I leave you here, you will be trampled by some ruthless boot. And when a ladybird landed on his nightclothes in 1949, he asked General Pownall to remove this exquisite and charming creature from my sleeve and allow it carefully to fly out of the window. Churchill delighted in circuses, carnivals, fairs, and zoos, enjoying especially the frolics of wrestling bears and acrobatic sea lions. He was particularly devoted to London Zoo, where a number of his animals were housed at different times, notably big beasts that were presented to him. In 1943, he was given a lion called Rota, and he sent this letter to the Duke of Devonshire, who served on the, Duke's council, uh, on the zoo's council, because the zoo, they weren't quite sure whether Churchill would want a lion. And he, they asked in very humble terms as whether he should have this lion. And he replied in a wonderfully funny letter, um, I shall have much pleasure in becoming the possessor of the lion, on condition that I do not have to feed it or take care of it, and that the zoo makes sure that it does not get loose. You are quite right in your assumption that I do not want a lion at the moment, either at Downing Street or Chequers, owing to the ministerial calm which prevails there. But the zoo is not far away, and situations may arise in which I shall have great need of the lion. <laughs> um, he liked uh, visiting and um, feeding Rota. You can see a lovely picture of him doing it there. And he once threatened to make a diminutive uh, private secretary, the lion's me uh, next meal, saying, meat is very short now, uh, this in, 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 the, uh, in the war with rationing. But the lion took Churchill for a ride, rather amusingly. Um, it was called Rota, after a, after a German printing machine company of that name, whose pre-war sales manager in England, a man named George Thompson, uh, had, um, had had it in Pinner, which is a, a, a sort of suburb of London. And understandably, the, the neighbors didn't like the lion uh, being in Pinner at all. It wasn't a suitable place for the lion. So eventually, George Thompson gave it to London Zoo. And then he, uh, and he, he arranged for it to go to Churchill. But he stipulated that when the lion died, when Rota died, um, he, he should have the... Um, the skin. Um, and Rota eventually did die in 1955 um, after siring some 50 cubs. He was obviously a, a fairly busy lion. Um, and, um, and so Thompson claimed the skin and he then had the lion stuffed and exhibited in a Piccadilly showroom, although somehow Churchill managed to prevent him from using his most famous Leonine quotation delivered in a speech remember, on his 80th birthday. It was the nation and the race dwelling all round the globe that had the lion's heart. I had the luck to be called upon to give the roar. And George Thompson wanted to put this uh, in, in the window, but uh, he wasn't allowed to do that. Well, anyway, Rota is now in America. You'll be glad to hear. He is in the Leitner Museum in St. Augustine, Florida. Um, so he, he came to a good end. Um, the zoo also accommodated Churchill's leopard, Sheba, some of his black swans and tropical fish and two white kangaroos, a token of esteem from South Australia. And these he received in 1947, saying that he didn't mind the publicity uh, and that the photographers could snap him as much as they liked in the lion's pouch, if they please, with all my legs sprawling about. <coughs> a lovely picture of Churchill in, in, the, in, the, in the kangaroo's pouch. Um, Sorry, the kangaroo, not lion. I'm getting mixed up with my animals. 
Furthermore, the zoo assisted uh, him with other animal transactions whereby Churchill cemented his friendship with President Roosevelt via a gift of Chartwell goldfish and anticipating modern panda diplomacy, he tried to mend his fences with Australia by importing a duck-billed platypus. Housed in a specially built platypusry on board the ship, it ate 70, 750 specially selected worms a day, supplemented by helpings of custard. But the voyage took longer than expected, and by the time the vessel reached the Panama Canal, its daily diet was cut to 600 worms, and the ship's master had to employ locals to dig up and a further 8,000 worms. The trouble was that the platypus didn't like Panamanian worms, and so it, it arrived in a reduced condition uh, near the end of its Atlantic voyage. Uh, the ship was attacked by German, a German submarine, and it retaliated with de de depth charges. And alas, the explosions further upset the creature's delicate mechanism. Its, its duck bill is so delicate that it can detect the flight of a mosquito. So it didn't like depth charges very much. Uh, and uh, the duck-billed platypus died. And Churchill was most upset about this, and he kept, the, he kept the whole operation secret, though he made the best of it by having the animal stuffed and presented to the Royal College of Surgeons. But you can see what a propaganda coup it would have been if he'd got the duck-billed platypus uh, from Australia. Churchill relished animal stories, especially those of Kipling. He confessed to roaming the jungles with Mowgli, and fighting for dear life in the, in the skin of the mongoose Rikitiki Tavi against the cobra nag. In fact, animals occupied a key place in his imagination. He identified with them, and they supplied his family and perhaps even his marital girlfriend um, uh, uh, with terms of endearment. You can't really read this. It's a very strange uh, letter in the archives, which I discovered, and um, it does suggest uh, that he didn't go to the altar of virgin. Um, and it's a mysterious letter because actually this woman, who we don't know who she is, we know where she lived, which is very close to Piccadilly. He called her dear, she called him Deary, and um, she, um, she confused him with Winston Churchill, by whom I mean, of course, the American novelist Winston Churchill. Um, so she, she, it's a complicated story, and I will tell you uh, if, if, uh, more details if you, if you ask me afterwards. Anyway, um, Churchill, Churchill used animal, uh, term, as, uh, animal names as terms of endearment. Churchill himself was pug or pig to Clementine's cat. And returning home, he would utter a sharp woof woof to be answered by her enthusiastic meow. And they often ended letters to each other with uh, sketches of their four-footed avatars. Their offspring, co collectively known as the kittens, had individual animal nicknames. The puppy kitten, Diana, the rabbit, Randolph, the bumblebee, Sarah, later called the mule because she was stubborn and wouldn't breed, and the duckadilly, Marigold, who died young. Unlike many patricians who notoriously preferred their horses and dogs to their children, Churchill was an affectionate parent. He played animal games with his brood, chasing them in the guise of a bear. There he's playing bear with bears with, uh, with Randolph. Um, or a gorilla, and the latter he imitated with uncanny accuracy, crouching behind bushes and jumping out with his arms swinging limply and baring his teeth and beating his chest and emitting a blood-curdling roar of grr, grr. Perhaps this impersonation was enhanced by the fact that in the opinion of David Lloyd George at least, Churchill physically resembled a gorilla. During the course of his career, needless to say, he was likened to a fantastic variety of creatures. Uh, among them, caterpillar, you can see that there, it's, it's, a, it's a brilliant thing, it's a little spoof on Alice in Wonderland. Um, caterpillar, rat, lion, warhorse, chicken, maggot, mongrel, porpoise, dinosaur, bulldog, inebriated, dragon, wild boar, and rogue elephant, and lots more t besides. Indeed, Churchill seemed to compel animal analogies. In a single dispatch to the Foreign Office, Britain's somewhat louche ambassador to the Soviet Union, Archie Clark Carr, likened Churchill, who was visiting Moscow, as we've heard, in 1942, to a bull about to charge, its eyes bloodshot and defiant, to a wounded lion, to a protean creature able to transform its features, as he put it, from the most laughing, dimpled, and mischievous baby's bottom into the face of an angry and outraged bulldog. Bullfrog, bullfrog, not bulldog. Uh, 
bullfrog. Clark Carr embellished his dispatch with what I think is the only semi-nude sketch of Churchill uh, in existence. Uh, you have to go to the archives to, uh, to, to, <laughs> to, to appreciate the real joy of Churchill. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Churchill himself pullulated with animal analogies. His head was a virtual Noah's Ark bursting with figures of speech. In fact, animal imagery loomed almost as large in his, in his rhetoric as mil the military metaphors uh, to which, as a soldier, he instinctively reached. Churchill ex exploited sheep, pigs, and other creatures as a source of personal amusement and oratorical entertainment, by which he brilliantly disarmed opposition in the commons. He once told Labour MPs, for example, I do not wish to cast my pearls before those who do not want them. So he <laughs> Um, sometimes he was less amiable. After Clement Attlee succeeded him as Prime Minister, uh, Churchill remarked unfairly but unforgettably, if a grub is fed on royal jelly, it turns into a queen bee. And, but uh, when Attlee's cabinet colleagues misbehaved in his absence, Churchill said, when the mouse is away, the cats will play. And he likened General de Gaulle to a female llama surprised in her bath. Um, my wife, Vivian, who's doing the, doing the heavy work, really, of, of uh, moving around, she got this picture. And uh, de Gaulle, of course, is normally uh, compared to a giraffe. But I think, uh, I think Churchill had something there, don't you? There's a, there's a, there's a very distinct similarity uh, between the llama and, and the general. Something about the ears is not quite right, but um, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's pretty good. Churchill ransacked the wilderness for bestial analogies with which to stigmatize his fiercest foes. He rejected a rapprochement with Nazi Germany by recalling the fable of the jackal who went hunting with the tiger and what happened after the hunt was over. He also branded Mussolini as a jackal and still more obnoxious a hyena. One of his most memorable taunts was directed against at those French generals who had prophesied in 1940 that within three weeks England would have her neck wrung like a chicken. You know the story, some chicken, some neck. The Soviet Union further tested, though it by no means exhausted, his feral lexicon. He represented the Bolsheviks as snakes, wolves, vultures, crocodiles, bears, vampires, typhus-bearing vermin, the tapeworm inside the Russian dog, the nameless beast foretold in Russian legend, and above all as baboons, hopping and capering amidst the ruin, ruins of civilizations, uh, civilization and the corpses of their victims. And when a Soviet delegation came to visit London in 1920, led by Leon, Leonid Krasin, um, Churchill asked the Foreign Secretary, Lord Curzon, did you shake hands with the hairy baboon? Uh, so that's how he uh, visualized them. Uh, of course, in using animals as emblems of virtue and vice, Churchill was drawing on a tradition that stretched from Aesop to Orwell, who, of course, depicted the communist leaders as, as pigs. And Churchill himself had a gift for fashioning fables. He adored butterflies and explained to his young nephew, Johnny, that, uh, the, uh, um, that caterpillars were, that were greedy and lazy were punished in their next world by becoming drab minnow browns meadow browns or common heaths, and living short, miserable lives, whereas a good caterpillar would become a gorgeous swallowtail or, or painted lady or even a Camberwell beauty and may be allowed to hibernate for the winter and enjoy the spring the following year. Still more compelling was his fable recounted in the Commons in 1928 designed to expose the folly of interwar disarmament. It's too long to, to quote, but it shows how each of the animals was willing to give up the weapons horns, teeth, claws, whatever it was, which it did not possess, and th their meeting to discuss disarmament almost brought them to blows. Such symbolism had a universal appeal. Animals are among the earliest denizens of the child's mind. They help to shape the adult, adult consciousness. They're integral to the culture of homo sapiens. They've been objects of veneration and detestation, victims of cruelty and sacrifice, subjects of art, literature, and myth, participants in war, 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 work, and play, at once a source of danger and a wellspring of health and happiness. They're slaughtered for food, but alive they nourish the human imagination. 
They are made of our common clay, but without the power of speech. They are alluring, but mysterious. So that, as Montaigne said, again to quote him, when we play with our cat, we're never sure whether we, we are playing with it or it is playing with us. Thus, animals become a screen onto which human beings down the ages have projected their own attributes, meek lamb, cunning fox, savage bull, busy bee, and so on. Churchill's association with animals was, as I've suggested, more than usually paradoxical and ambivalent. He loved faithful dogs, but damned miserable curs, and he feared the black dog, the black dog of depression that constantly prowled at his heels. I don't agree with Andrew about this, actually. Uh, I think he did suffer from depression, and many people do, and that's no weakness. Um, it's it's a, a, an affliction rather than something that we should be ashamed of. Um, the black dog depression uh, that constantly prowled at his heels and sometimes jumped on his back. He hunted foxes but kept fox cubs at Chartwell as pets. He speared hogs but scratched the backs of pigs, and he depicted himself, of course, as a pig. He loved both fish and fishing. Churchill was likened to Pooh Bear, but he warned that Red Bruin was padding across the steps towards Europe on bloodstained paws. Later, he added this thought. A bear in the forest is a matter of legitimate speculation. A bear in the zoo is an object of public curiosity. A bear in your wife's bed causes the gravest concern. <laughs> that again is, uh, Helen did that for me, uh, which is a lovely picture. Wherever you looked, just to conclude, in Churchill's life, his speeches, and his writing, you find the creatures that have shared the earth with mankind throughout history. Churchill's life is, in key respects, an animal story. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, let me brief you as to what's going to happen next. Um, we're going to um, have lunch, which will be like yesterday, buffet style. It's right outside, and then we invite you to come back in here at uh, noon. We're going to announce the winners of the silent auction, and we will also be having a uh, briefing and a, a short film about next year's conference, which is due to take place in London in 2020. But before I let you go to lunch, there's uh, one final bit of business that I want to talk about. Oh, oh, oh also, excuse me. Um, the buses for the cinema, we have three. Um, the first bus will leave at 12.15 from directly in front of the hotel, the second bus at 12.30, the third bus at 12.45, and um, at the cinema, we'll then explain the transportation that will uh, get you back here or to your next destination. But before I let you break for lunch, um, we want to recognize um, our two special guests at this year's conference, Edwina and Celia Sands. And Justin here has got some uh, flowers to present.